good, mo good afternoon. If everybody would take their seats, uh, grab their coffee, get their, uh, their cookies, uh, we'll start uh, our program here. Welcome to the, the third roundtable of 2023, uh, sponsored by the uh, Bonner Milltown History Center. Uh, this is the 37th roundtable uh, that we've had in the programs over the years since the History Center was created. And so it's quite a, a milestone for us. Um, we have cookies and coffee in the back. Uh, please feel free to uh, enjoy that, but don't overindulge because at the end of the program, uh, we'll have our, our annual uh, St. Patrick's Day uh, pasty dinner available for $7. That comes with coleslaw gravy, or if you, and you can eat that here. If, if you want to just uh, get pasties to go, uh, they'll be sold for $7. And that's put on courtesy of St. Anne Church Parish Council. And we want to thank them very much for doing this once again. This is the first program we've had at, at St. Anne's since the beginning of the, uh, of the COVID pandemic. Uh, we have had uh, several uh, programs at the Kettle House. And of course, the Kettle House has different beverages that are available uh, other than just coffee and cookies. So, uh, but we'll enjoy uh, the, the refreshments we have here today. Uh, for housekeeping, the bathrooms are here behind this uh, partition. Uh, so if the urge comes upon you, that's where the bathrooms are. Um, we'd like to acknowledge, as we always do, that we're living in the ancestral homeland of the Salish, Kootenai, Ponderay, Native American tribes. And uh, we want to thank them and acknowledge them because we enjoy living in the lands that they protected for thousands of years, took care of the lands and took care of the waters that we enjoy today. So we want to remember that this is their homeland, which is now, thankful to them, has become our homeland. And we want to thank St. Anne's Church uh, for allowing us to uh, gather here for our round table. Uh, we much appreciate uh, them in letting us use their space here. Uh, we have MCAT we want to thank uh, taking videos of this program as they have all of our programs and they're available uh, on MCAT. This one will be available about a month from now, uh, but you can get on MCAT and you can look at any of the previous roundtable programs we had on MCAT. And we want to thank uh, Ron Scholl, who's been here for I don't know how long, taking uh, the videos of our program. So thank you very much, Ron. And we have our faithful sound technician, uh, Walter Peckham, who's also been here providing all the sound equipment and uh, so everybody can hear a lot of gray hair out there and I know I'm hard of hearing, so having a good sound system is pretty important. Uh, we wanna thank the Friends of Two Rivers uh, they have sponsored the Bonner Milltown History Center since its beginning and continue to support us and we much appreciate that. Uh, and then we want to thank uh, the, uh, the owners of the Bonner Property Development, uh, Steve Nelson, Mike Bamey, and Mike Heisey uh, for providing uh, the the facility that the History Center is in next to uh, the post office. And that's had a long history of being restaurants, being 
small stores being a credit union, uh, lots of things, but today it's the, the location of the Bonner Milltown History Center. So, and we have programs there. We have open dates uh, on Tuesday mornings from yeah, around nine until noon. Uh, we have a gathering for coffee and cookies uh, just to talk about uh, things that happened in the mill. We get about 10, 13, 14 people there uh, every Tuesday morning and tell stories, some you can believe, some you can't believe. Uh, but it's, a, it's a, a fun gathering of mainly old mill people that join us on, on Tuesday mornings. Uh, we're open uh, Wednesday mornings from 10 to noon. Uh, and, uh, so, and then Fridays we have a group that's Old Roads and Trails uh, that talks about the Mullen Road, the Trail to the Buffalo, uh, the logging railroad that went up the Blackfoot, uh, just various aspects of uh, our transportation system that was developed from long, long ago till today uh, here in the Bonner area. I'd like to mention that on the table over here somewhere, Anna's got it, is a trophy that was given to Judy Madsen this last week. Judy is our fearless leader at the History Center, and the trophy is for uh, being the Museum Person of the Year in Montana. <laughs> and I can tell you, she well deserved that, that trophy. Uh, on a sadder note, I wanted to mention that uh, we've lost one of our members of the History Center in the past two weeks. Uh, Bob Lamley passed away about two weeks ago. Uh, he has been buried at the Veterans Cemetery, and we think that the family hopefully will have some type of memorial later this spring, early summer, so that people can gather, give their condolences to the Lamley family, and tell stories about their remembrance of Bob Lamley. Uh, he was uh, influential in many of our lives, so it was sad that he was he passed on, but he was 95 years old. And so he had a great life here in western Montana and his influence on the Bonner area, the Bonner Mill and the timberlands associated with it. So with that, I will introduce Dennis Sane, and Dennis Sane will in introduce our speaker for the day. Yes, folks, uh, I'm glad to see you. a nice turnout, bigger than we've had most of the year. And I would like to introduce Mr. Bill Taylor and his wife, Jan. They have written several railroad books on railroad history. And if you want history of the Northern Pacific, look to Mr. Taylor and Mrs. Taylor. They, she was the past president of the Northern Pacific Railroad Historical Association. And Bill Taylor, he's on the board of directors of the Northern Pacific. So Bill Taylor, there you are. I'm the program before the pasties, so if you get hungry, I, yeah, okay. I, I don't need this mic, the techie just told me so. <clears throat> Welcome, thank you very much for coming out today. Uh, I've been invited to speak to you about the ethnicity of the folks that built railroads through this area, and I will do that indirectly. Uh, my chief interest is in railroad history, not just Northern Pacific, but also Milwaukee Road and the Big Blackfoot and all the others that surveyed this way over the course of the last century plus. When I do one of these programs, and I've done several, I don't read it to you. I'm going to just talk to you. We're going to tell stories. And those stories are going to be keyed into some pictures that I have up here, I hope. <laughs> 
and then uh, we'll field some questions or whatever you want to do with it. And when you reach a point where it's time to eat pasties, Anna, your job is to tell me it's time to shut up, okay? Please? Okay. Of all the people I know, she's the one most qualified to do this. <clears throat> I'm, every time I'm out here, and I don't know, I've been part of the group for a, a while, um, I'm always struck with what a historical location this is at the confluence of the Clark Fork and the Blackfoot. Uh, the natives knew that from the year aught and used this route to come through the Hellgate and to the lands of the buffalo uh, because it was the shortest distance to where the buffalo lived and they could sneak up the valley and avoid the black feet. And the journals of Lewis and Clark, when Lewis went up there in 1806, he reported a road, he used the word road, I think, <coughs> that was 200 feet wide in some places and marked with stone cairns so that everybody could find it. Now, it wasn't a road like we think of roads because it kind of braided through the trees, but it was a route that a lot of folks had followed for a long time. And it's always bred some questions in my mind. <clears throat> I realized that Lewis and Clark were under some political instructions when they headed west and there were some political components to what they were doing. And their chief goal was to find horses, which is what Sacagawea was able to do when they wandered into salmon. But I have to believe that Lewis and Clark, who explored a lot along the riverbanks, who spent the better part of a month looking for portage routes over the Great Falls, down near where Fort Benton is today, had to have seen the other end of this road. And they had to have wondered where that road led to. And when Lewis went back, I think he had an old crap reaction because <laughs> he made that trip in about three days, which took him four months going the other way. Now he accomplished some of the political goals of going that way and it put salmon on the map and the Salmon River and so forth. But uh, expediency, Thomas Jefferson had the idea that, you know, they knew where the Missouri River was, they knew where the Columbia River came out, they knew they went in opposite directions. Up there somewhere is a mountain where you probably go up over this ridge where the Continental Divide is and down the other side. Can you imagine Lewis's consternation in Whitehall when he climbed up on that mountain to look to the west and all he saw was row on row on row of snow-capped peaks leading out to the west. And his consternation when he crossed Cadot Pass up here on the Blackfoot and he sees the Missouri River right out there. So anyway, it's a, it's a place that is very great historical significance to Montana from the inception of the white history here and long before that with the Native American history here. And uh, railroads were just kind of what came along as part of that history. You know, they, they didn't operate in a vacuum either. They knew uh, the general routes out here because of the 1855 Isaac Stevens survey John Mullen and his road work out here uh, left lots of records and worked as a consultant with the NP people when they built the first line through here. And you could look at any topographical map of this part of the country, of which there were some already in 1883, and see that the only logical east-west route through the western side of the Continental Divide was the Clark Fork Valley. It's the only one. The only one that's close to it is the Blackfoot. But the Blackfoot went up into Indian country. That's where the Indians were going, it was up into Indian country. And every other railroad I know of that thought about coming west surveyed the Blackfoot. The Union Pacific surveyed the Blackfoot. The Chicago Northwestern surveyed the Blackfoot. The Milwaukee had plans to build a second main line through the Blackfoot to connect with their other lines in Great Falls. <coughs> on and on and on, and nobody built up there. And why is that? And I think it has to do with all that rough country on the east side. If you've taken Highway 200 to Great Falls, all that up and down stuff is the sort of thing that drives railroads crazy. My granddad always told me, my granddad was a uh, construction guy. He uh, ran away from home when he was 11, went in the First World War, learned how to drive a truck, <coughs> came out as a heavy equipment operator, did that most of the rest of his life, worked for the state highway system in a couple of uh, places over the years. And he always said, we owe our highway system 
to the Buffalo. And as a kid, I thought, what? <laughs> What's the highway system got to do with Buffalo? And his logic was that Buffalo went to water and left a trail. The Indians followed the trails to find the Buffalo. The fur trappers followed the Indians. The covered wagons followed the fur trappers. The army followed everybody. And then came the Montana highway system. If you look at a Montana map, highway map, what you notice is that the majority of population is in the Yellowstone River Valley and the Clark Fork River Valley out to the west, which, by the way, is where I-90 goes to serve all those people and where the Northern Pacific Railroad went. And the truth of it is people came here first because of the railroad and the opportunities it provided. So where are we here? Jan, slide, please. These are the books that Jan and I have done on railroads in Montana. We mostly deal with the construction era and the branch lines because our first interest was in mining in camps. And then as we explored mining camps, we discovered that those who were online tended to survive, online in those days being the railroad, and those who weren't tended to die, of which Montana has a lot of those. And then it was literally downhill into studying the history of why the railroads went where they did. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I like to tailor these things, pardon the pun, to where I'm at. So you're going to hear a focusing story on Bonner and the ethnicity of those who came here and where we are today. And th this can be either a long story or a short one. You want to hear the short one? Who built the railroads to Bonner? You're looking at them. Right here in this room. You're looking at the prodigy of people who built the railroads in Montana. Wave after wave after wave of immigrants who came to the shores over the course of 150, 200 years, leaving behind homelands and regions where their families probably had existed for centuries because until the development of the railroad, most people lived and died within 25 miles of where they were born. It just was too awkward to go beyond that. And what an effort that took. And they came here, and they washed up on the beach, and they couldn't speak the language, and they didn't have any jobs, and they didn't have much resources, and it was a struggle. And they followed opportunities where they came. Where they, came. they tended to cluster up because they liked talking to other people, and they spoke the same language. And they had children. And the children, it was very important to them that they are Americans, that they spoke English, they acted American, they went to American schools, they did American stuff, and so they didn't tell them about the old country. And the third generation grows up wondering, why is my name Johansson? <laughs> And they start searching for that ethnic connection. And there's a lot of interest right now in all sorts of places about genealogy and where we come from and family names and so forth, which is Jan's department. She's very good at that. And one of the things I can say with some authority, there's nobody sitting in this room unless you are a full-blood Native American. And I don't see any. <clears throat> there's nobody sitting in this room they can trace their family back more than 15 generations in this country. The first whites came here in 1607 that stayed. There might have been a few dabbling around before that, the Vikings and stuff, but they all went home. 1607 is 15 generations ago. So every one of us sitting here in this room is an immigrant of a family that came here sometime in the last 15 generations. Most of us can trace our family back to our grandparents, maybe our great-grandparents, especially if you stay put. But one of the things we learn about the human animal, they never stay put. They move. They follow opportunities. And as those opportunities present themselves, they go there. And so most of our family histories are of a succession of moves as people did that. Let me give you an example. I came from a broken home, raised by a single parent. I really didn't have notion of family. I'm an only child. <clears throat> family sort of began and end with me. That's the, th that's the thing about only children. 
But Jan's done a lot of work on both sides of the family and come to find out my family on my side came to this country in 1630. That's only 20 years after the Mayflower. They weren't on it, but they could see the masts going over the horizon as they followed along behind. The other side of the family came into Virginia in about 40 years later. Now the northern family, we can trace them to about oh, early 1800s in New York. We have, I have a relative that fought as a uh, soldier in the American Revolution. We know that because we have his petition to be given a pension as a result of his war record. And then we know that uh, in 1853, they were in Indiana because when they were in Indiana, they bought two wagons and my great-great-grandfather Daniel and his son William, for whom I'm named, I, fi I find out, went over the Oregon Trail with their families to Washington State, which was just a territory, where the first wagons over the Natchez Pass homesteaded in what's now downtown Puyallup. Uh, had a little problem with the Nisqually Indians that were being stirred up by the Hudson Bay Company, hid out in Fort Stillicum for a while. My great-granddad, William, was sent as a dispatch rider to Seattle to bring troops. Yeah, this is the American story, right? This is what you read about in the books. And you have stories like that. Every family has a history. It's just that we don't know them most of the time. There's no record of it. And the only reason I know is because of the work Jan's done. So let's move on, Jan. We'll get to the subject, I promise. <clears throat> if we're looking at railroad history, and that's really why I'm here, not to lecture you about your ethnology, uh, the first railroad to come through was in 1883. Eh, not technically correct. The first railroad into Montana was 1882 with the Union Pacific, Utah Northern, which built up from Salt Lake City, but it didn't get any farther than Garrison. The Northern Pacific was the land grant railroad number three of five that President Lincoln had signed into law at the end of the Civil War and had chartered. And uh, this was the third one to be built. They eventually all would be. We all know the first one was the Union Pacific across the middle side of the country with the Golden Spike at Promontory. We all know that story. And then this is the Northern Pacific. Guess what the Southern one was called? Southern Pacific, <laughs> then there was a Central Pacific, and then there's this goofy Illinois Central, which nobody really knows about. <clears throat> so, um, like all government programs, it's a really good idea. I mean, the U.S. government learned the hard way in the Civil War that railroads made fighting wars easier. You move faster, you move troops and equipment faster, and Part of the reason the North won the war was because they had a better railroad system in 1860 than the South did. They'd been building them longer. There was more entrepreneurs doing it. And so at the end of that war, as they looked to aftermath and that manifest destiny business of tying the two shores together, because civilization was way out in California if there was any at that time, not out here, uh, they decided that they would build this network of other railroads. But how are they going to pay for that? How do you convince a company to build 2,000 miles of iron railroad when there's nobody out here to ship on it? The natives didn't need it much, <clears throat> didn't ship many things on the railroad. And so the idea they came up with was land grants. And they, one thing the government had was lots of land. They had just, uh, with the treaties of the 1850s and 60s, can find a lot of the, uh, the native tribes to reservations. What the land that was left over became government land, and now they had lots of that. And so, Jan, if you would do the slide. This is a map of Montana. The green swath is the land grants that the railroad was given to help defray the cost of building through this desert. There was nobody out here. The map is a little deceptive because actually it's alternating squares. It's not a solid block like that. Mile squares, and we all know about land grants and you get a mile either side of the right of way uh, as part of your, your land grant. But what you don't always know is that in rough terrain, look around you, you can get up to 50 miles 
on either side of the right-of-way in alternating squares. If the land was already owned, and in 1883 there were enough settlers in the Clark Fork Valley and in Missoula that a lot of the river bottoms were owned, then they got offsetting sections into places that were more remote. So, for example, I've put the, this is the red dot is Bonner. It stretches all the way from Swan Lake clear down to the Montana-Idaho border at, at Lost Trail where NP land grant sections, mile squares, for which they didn't get the mineral rights, but they did get the rights to salvage timber, to sell off, to trade as they saw fit, to offset the costs of building the railroad. And they did so. And so, Jan, a slide, please. Why, why did they come to this railroad land? Well, post-Civil War, Montana had had its first insurge of traffic in the 1860s when gold was discovered, and we get that gold rush. We also get a lot of refugees from the Civil War, both north and south. How many Grantsdales, Grant Creeks, Lee Creeks do we have in Montana that were all named by these folks, Confederate Gulch and so forth? Had to be interesting times in the bars that night when they're all together. <laughs> But uh, uh, what that does is it's a temporary thing because placer mining, which you can do with a gold pan, very quickly peters out. And what you need is money and way to haul heavy equipment in to do the hardcore mining that required to get the real riches. So by 1880s, that's starting to happen. It's being freighted in up at Fort Benton on the river boats. It's being freighted in over Monida Pass from the first transcontinental down at Corinne, Utah. Uh, but that's expensive and time-consuming stuff. And so the NP starts to build in 1870. They had surveyed in 1870. And when you look at Missoula, we all know the story about Missoula and how the first manifestation of that was Hellgate Village by C.P. Higgins who saw the opportunity of trading along the, the Mullen Road at the confluence with the Bitterroot Valley, had to have watched with some interest as those surveyors went through surveying for the proposed railroad that didn't go to Hellgate Village. It was five miles to the north running along the base of the hills. And then we have to wonder about the motivation for moving Hellgate Village to Missoula, <coughs> where he built his mill. I don't think that's the only answer that the, the, they moved to Missoula. And bought up all the land at the base of the mountain over here at Waterworks Hill, Mr. Higgins did. So when the uh, railroad built through, got here in June 2nd, 1883 from the west, slide please, Jan. Uh, well, what are you doing? Let's go back, let's go back. One more. Stop. <coughs> Technology, it's wonderful. <coughs> um, if we look at, where's the, find the map of Missoula. That's what I was looking for. See? What happened to that? Right, there it is. All right, I think things got shuffled somewhere along the line. Um, if we look at an 1884 map of Missoula, you can't help but notice that all of the development is down here on Mullen Road, which is the front in, in Higgins, and there's nothing up there where the railroad is. In fact, the first depot is two blocks to the west on Woody Street. Why do you suppose that is? They didn't want to pay the price for the land. Higgins wanted a pretty price. So the depot is here, right about where the orange Right underneath where, where the Orange Street underpass is, that was the major crossing in those days that connected the north side of the south. Well, Higgins Avenue was open. And the shops and complexes, that land was donated by a guy by the name of Erlen, And they were located about the same distance to the east. And for the first several years, uh, that's the way Missoula was. There was no depot at the end of the street like there is today. That depot is going to last until 1902, 
when a new de depot was commissioned on ground at the end of Higgins Avenue because CP has died by that time and his son, recognizing the economic realities of having a railroad close, uh, donated the land to the railroad company and agreed to build the new depot. Now, that's the first time there'd been anything to cut off Higgins Avenue from the north side. You know those north siders, they get a little tricky once in a while. And there was a lot of uproar about that. And about, uh, well, they were within a month of having the depot finished when it mysteriously caught fire one night. And the newspaper accounts say they can't prove it was arson, but they'd had a series of fires. The, the Higgins warehouse had burned down and they'd been a fire in the original depot. <coughs> but the smell of kerosene was very strong. <laughs> Whereupon a new building was chartered, and the one we have now was completed in 1903, made out of bricks that were salvaged out of Tacoma, Washington, and a proposed uh, office building that didn't get built because of a national panic uh, that had taken place. And we still have it today. Slide, please. Now let's go forward. Always forward. Here's a story about the coming of the first train into Missoula on June the 2nd, 1883. And the party that was going on in town to celebrate that. And one of the things that happened was that Mr. Warden of Warden's Market, of which we still have, <clears throat> had put aside a barrel of whiskey at Warden's Market to be opened on the occasion of the first train into Missoula. They opened it and the results were reported to be very fine. <laughs> and, and the party was had by all. Slide please, Jan. That's pretty primitive up at that end of town in those days. This picture I think is taken from the original depot's platform looking to the north towards Waterworks Hill. You see the Gold Dust Saloon and there's a Gold Dust apartment sort of there on that location these days. Uh, the natives that are busy going by with their travois, we're not quite sure where they're coming from, whether they're coming from the Buffalo and the Hellgate Canyon, or they're coming up the valley from the Bitterroot as part of the general movement to the mission, we don't know. But it shows how much on the trail we were uh, as late as, I don't know. Who can tell me why they have fir trees tied to the posts on that gold dust saloon over there? It can't be Christmas time, there's no snow. Why do you tie fir trees to the posts on a hotel balcony? Don't know. Air freshener. Air freshener, yeah. <laughs> Slide, please. We, probably most of you have seen this picture of the disconnected buildings that consisted of the first roundhouse. This is an F.J. Haynes photograph taken from Waterworks Hill. It's always dated at 1890. I think that's way too late. I think this has got to be 1884. He might have got around just publishing it in 1890. Uh, and I'm a little suspicious that all those locomotives that are parked on the line down there are being towed through on their way to other stations along the line as the railroad is stitched together. Within two years, there'll be a brick roundhouse on that site. Notice the vacant land between the railroad and downtown. And to this day, to this day, that's still vacant down there. Where that big parking lot is with the old Missoulian building, uh, it's never, ever filled in like most cities do around the railroad. Slide, please, Jan. By 1928, this is what Missoula looked like. This is a picture taken from the first depot of the new depot and of the engine yards and things uh, that are just north of the tracks. Uh, there were six different roundhouses on this site over the years. Last one was constructed in 1922 and torn down in the 1980s. I have pictures of both, building and taking it down. Uh, very busy place uh, in those days. Slide, please, Jan. And the people who worked there. This is a guy by the name of uh, McLean. I don't think he's any re uh, relative of Norman McLean, but I don't know. Uh, he's obviously just been promoted to passenger service as a brakeman. Uh, he's gone out to J.C. Penney's probably and bought his new blue serge suit, which he had to do by himself. The railroad gave him some buttons. He had to buy his own pocket watch. You can see the gold chain over there, which was a very expensive piece of equipment. 
And he actually has a long career in Missoula. He works in Missoula for about 30 years and dies at an avalanche on the Wallace branch in 1933. So he, he's an interesting guy. Slide, please. Let's move now to the east. We need to go back and pick up the ethnicity. I was hired to, to talk about ethnicity. Let's go back to the beginning, Jen. Things have gotten shuffled. That's all right. There, stop. Whoa, back. Um, we all know about the Chinese, and they were here. The Chinese uh, built the west end of the Union Pacific almost exclusively, the Central Pacific part, because it was gold rush day, and the biggest problem that the railroads had getting labor was they'd hire people to come out, and they all went to the gold fields, and they did never work for the railroad. The Chinese, they were able to hire in gangs by a contractor who was also Chinese. He would recruit in China. He would book passage on a ship to come to us from China. They would work as a gang. They were paid as a gang. They were housed as a gang. They were fed as a gang. And they were sent home as a gang. And by 1885, we had the Anti-Chinese Exclusion Act to prohibit any further Chinese development. Well, a few must have leaked out because I grew up in Helena and Helena had a sizable Chinese community, as did Butte. Uh, we know that they were into the mines. They were famous for going into placers and reworking them after the white miners had given up and making lots of money. Uh, so they were here, uh, much to their credit. But the NP also used Chinese miners on the West End for the same reasons. 1883, it's still hard to get labor out here in the West. And so they did the same thing that the Central Pacific did. They hired gangs of Chinese to come over and work on the constructions. Uh, this is somewhere out on the West End. The upper left picture is down near Heron along the lower Clark Fork. Uh, the right picture is somewhere not too far west of uh, Paradise, and the bottom one also west of Paradise with Chinese labor working out there. But by 1882, when the NP reached what's now Plains and, Thompson, and Paradise, which wasn't there in those days, or the fourth crossing of the Flathead River, and you think about the railroad bridges, the fourth crossing, that's where you entered the proposed reservation for the Confederate and Salish tribes, just like it is today. And the government charter prohibited the railroad from distributing alcohol in any form to Native Americans by treaty. And so they were afraid that the Chinese, who apparently liked their rice wine, and the Irish, who <laughs> we just had St. Paddy's Day, we know what the Irish liked, uh, wouldn't, shouldn't be allowed to work across the reservation for fear that they would violate this provision and the NP would lose its charter. So they fired them all uh, and they did other stuff out on the West End and they were replaced with Mormon crews who had just finished the line from up the Deer Lodge Valley to Garrison in 1882 and because the Mormon church has a tenet that they don't approve of alcohol drinking and we've never seen one that did, um, the, the railroad thought that there would be better crews to construct this portion. So, Jan, picture, one more, one more, I hate this, one more, all right, we'll stop here for a minute. <clears throat> and the, the pictures of you see, which you'll see in a minute, I guarantee it, of, of a Mormon crew uh, working their way into Missoula, laying the ties probably purchased from A.B. Hammond that we've all heard about. We'll talk about that in a minute. The biggest problem for the NP uh, getting to Missoula, and remember it was being built from both ends at the same time, the biggest problem on the West End was this. This is Merritt Trestle, Merritt Gulch, out here where you start up Evero Hill. 250 feet tall, 750 feet long, somewhere near a million board feet of lumber in that, and it took a while to put all that together. 
And uh, it was a somewhat of a tourist attraction for early Missoulians. We have newspaper stories about people going out there to watch Frenchie walk his high wire act across the piers of the, Mel of the Merritt Trestle. Don't have any photos, but there's another ethnic connection for you. Here's the story out of the June 1st, 1883, Missoulian. Missoulian? Yes. Slide, please, Jan. Here's the crew, the crew working into Missoula. Anybody want to guess where this is? I'll give you a hint. It's within five miles of Missoula. You know where Vigilante Storage is out there west of town on the old highway? It's coming down that little hill there. The highway used to do the same thing until they tore it down a few years ago. And notice those uh, ties. They're just flattened on one side. They're axe ties. Uh, the railroad put these out at contract. We figure they got about two or three cents a tie. A guy could do eight or nine of them in a day. You're not working for much, are you? But uh, A.B. Hammond and E.L. Bonner and William Clark and Marcus Daly and a few others, recognizing a financial opportunity, formed the Northwest Improvement Company or the Montana Improvement Company. It all depends on what project they're working on. I looked at that a little bit. And they got the contract from the NP to provide ties for the construction of the NP from about Paradise East. And they went out on the land grant lands and they cut wood, which was permitted by the terms of the land grant to make these ties, and that, there they are. And then a few years later, the administration changed and somebody brought suit against them because apparently they weren't real careful about only cutting trees on land grant lands. And Bill and I got into an argument about just when those lands would have been surveyed. Uh, and I suspect there were no markers. And so who can tell a government tree from a private tree when you go out into the forest in 1883 and they harvested all this lumber? But being the influential Montana citizens that they were, they agreed to support a candidate who would go to Congress and would get this killed, which he did. And one of the explanations for the great feud that you hear between Marcus Daly and William Clark and Hammond and the others is because when they got done being Republicans, then Marcus Daly wanted to go back being Democrats and half of them refused to do it. They liked being Republicans and they didn't ever get over it. Marcus Daly then came into the valley down here in the Bitterroot, developed all the timberlands in the south end of the valley, created Hamilton and built Hamilton. That's his town, that's why his mansion's there and was quoted as saying, when I get done, tumbleweeds will be blowing down Higgins Avenue by the Missoula Mercantile. <laughs> I know, there might have been a tumbleweed or two that blew by, but it looked to me like the Mercantile was doing all right. But bring that home to why A.B. Hammond leaves Missoula, that and the death of his wife. Uh, I suspect he saw the handwriting on the wall and he did much better in Oregon and California. They love him out there. I think we love him here too, don't we? Well, except the guy that wrote that book. He didn't like him much. Uh, okay, going on. Looking for some evidence of who's here, you can go to the census. Uh, the 1890 census doesn't exist. It got burned up in a fire. So you gotta look at the 1900 census. Uh, very difficult to track down where these people are in these census. They, they deal with political subsets of regions that I don't know where they are. Uh, these appear to be a census of this part of the world and the green ones are a Japanese crew. Now there should be a yellow one. Jenny got the wrong one here. All right. Anyway, the 1900 census shows about 15 Japanese laborers on the census that were actually working out at Heron, a place called Smeeds, but they were here, Japanese. The 1910 census doesn't show any Oriental people here at all, but it does show 
a lot of folks working up the river on the Blackfoot as log drivers and sawyers and all sorts of things. So if you're trying to trace ethnicity of people who were here at Bonner working at Lumber, uh, I think the 1910 census would help you out a great deal. The 1900, not so much. Okay, let's go on, Jen. As you moved east of Missoula, the Banman area out here east of town, across the river from East Missoula, uh, is kind of a spaghetti puzzle. The NP came across there in three different alignments. The first one, in 1883 is the Green Line. They crossed the river twice, once very near uh, East Missoula, and the other one over here at, uh, at West Riverside, I guess that is. Um, and uh, it lasted for about five years. The Deer Creek Road that goes through Canyon Village out there, that's on the old right-of-way of the NP there. You can drive a bit of that. And you used to be able to see the two bridge abutments. Um, but development out there in the last four or five years has obscured a lot of that. You can still see the east one pretty good. If you go down to Canyon Village, you go to where they have their maintenance building there at the east end of the complex, right up against the end of that building is this embankment, which is the old bridge abutment for that railroad bridge in 1883. It lasts till 1890 and the bridges need to be replaced. They weren't built out of creosote timber, so they had rotted out. And rather than replace them, the NP moved the railroad over onto Marshall Grade. So the old Highway 10 right-of-way on Marshall Grade was actually done by the Northern Pacific Railroad in 1890. And it's gonna last up until 1908, but Marshall Grade being Marshall Grade, there was a lot of trouble with falling rock out there, and I think you've probably all seen that famous photograph of the engine in the river, the passenger train in the river, that hit a rock and ended up in the Clark Fork, everybody standing around getting their pictures taken by the destroyed cars. So in 1908, as the Milwaukee was starting to build through, and the NP was looking at having to give the Milwaukee right away through this constricted part of the world, uh, they started making other plans and they decided they were going to double track their own line to increase the traffic volume and compete better with the Milwaukee and the Great Northern. And they straightened the line out and the red line is the 1908 version which comes back across Banman and then crosses the river out here a little bit east of town. Uh, and of course all this work is being done just as the 1908 flood hits. And the 1908 flood washed out most of the new work east of Missoula. Beaver Tail Tunnel caved in, bridges washed out. The big cement uh, abutment for this Bandman Bridge got washed out and to this day lies there in the river. When the water's low, you can see it down there for where it washed out. And it all had to be redone. And then Winston Brothers, the contractor, also had the contract for doing the Milwaukee Road, who was building through at that time. And so they elected to rebuild the NP before the Milwaukee because they could get materials out on the NP. And, you know, besides, I think the NP was a bigger contract. <clears throat> and so the Milwaukee entry into Missoula is delayed. Slide, please, Jan. Here's a plat of East Missoula. East Missoula appears to be laid out about 1908, but went bankrupt and didn't get developed again until the 1930s. Uh, lots were sold at auction. And in fact, Jan's family, uh, her dad and his brother and their father, all bought lots in East Missoula. And that's where the family was, uh, well, part of it up until modern times again. You can see a bit of the grades indicated on this map. This is the original main line. This is where it comes off of Marshall Grade. And the red here is the new double track main line. What it doesn't show is the streetcar. And I was a little wondering why it doesn't. The streetcar system to get out to Bonner used the NP grade, the 1908 grade out over Marshall Grade. They just took over the tracks from Van Buren Street out through East Missoula, out around Marshall Grade, to Bonner, up around the Margaret Hotel, and then back again. 
And, and that doesn't seem to be indicated here, except there is a, a faint thing here, electric line, which I think probably denotes the streetcar system. Right. Clark built the streetcars when he built the dam. You know, he came in here and he built the dam and he built Western, well, he brought Western lumber in from Lothrop and put it on here on the Blackfoot and then the, the streetcar system. Slide, please, Jim. Here's an early aerial photo of Bonner. This is 1937 Forest Service photo. Uh, it's the first series of photos the Forest Service took from planes. And I have picked the one here showing Bonner. So here you have your Clark Fork River. Uh, over here is the Milwaukee Road that built through in 1909. Uh, here comes the NP. And here's Route 1 that went up to both the Bandman Bridge and also the Marshall Grade. And then in 1908 was realigned to go across the river here by the, where the trucks uh, plaza is now and crossing the river below the dam. Here's Bonner Dam. It's been 10 years since that dam, dam went out and now I'm finding people who say, what dam? <laughs> <clears throat> if we look up river here, we see Western Lumber. Now by this time, it's closed, but ACM is still using some of the facilities. You can see the log yard, you can see some of the structures and so forth. Here's West Riverside, here's Riverside, here's the ACM mill. And in, in 1937, it looks pretty much like it did at the end of things or does today. Here's the dam for the log pond. Here's your Milwaukee tracks coming down with logs up the Blackfoot and so forth. What I find interesting about this photo, and maybe you can't see it from where you are, all these little paths that are coming out of these neighborhoods, and they're all going the same place. Where are they going? They're going to work. They're all working out there at the mill, and the kids are going to school, and everybody's walking. Nobody has cars yet in 1937 at the end of the Great Depression, or at least not very many. And that's true of all this. Here's Piltsville, Fintown, all the trails headed off for the, for the mill uh, in this aerial photograph. Slide, please. This is uh, Northern Pacific yard plat of Bonner at the time when the Milwaukee was coming through. I cut this off, but you'll see it's both Northern Pacific and it's what it's doing is making allowances for the CM and PS as the Milwaukee was known uh, when it first built through. And it's, what's interesting about it is it shows the original main line and it shows the new main line being built, but it also shows how the NP got into the mill, which has pretty much all been obliterated. And you see right here, present depot. So the little gray building across the tracks over here that the guy has full of stuff uh, originally sat there. And then in 1909, they had to accommodate the Milwaukee with that track that it now exists where they went up into Clearwater Yard and comes back around and crosses Highway 200 and in. And that happens down here. And that's where the depot got moved. Now, the circles I run in, people are very interested in depots, and they're very interested in why the Bonner Depot is the only one anybody knows of that has an operator's bay on both sides, north and south. Operator's bays are usually for operators to watch train movements. The bay sticks out so they can see down the tracks. Usually located on the main line so they can see trains coming and going. So we understand here, we can see the main lines going to the north of the depot would have a bay. Here, the main line goes to the south of the depot. Why two bays? Because they never turned the depot around. They just slid it down there with horses. And it was easier to build a new bay on the south side than it was to turn the depot around. And to this day, if you go look at that building over there, it has operator's bays on both sides, a very unique thing. Slide, please, Jan. Here's a picture of it in situ. Uh, this would be right down here where the caboose used to be, uh, where it was until it was moved in the 70s, sold by BN. And that big cut that's, uh, that was brought the 
the grade down on this little bit of the world. Uh, right across from the depot was the section house, still there. There's a family living in it. Looks pretty much like it did in railroad days. Hasn't been violated much. The Milwaukee depot, actually, and I'm having trouble ever really finding a depot per se, uh, but it was across the river at Bonner Junction where the Milwaukee's branch line came across the river on what you guys call the Duck Bridge. And uh, the word I get from the old railroaders is that both the Milwaukee, at least in later days, so both the Milwaukee and the NP crews worked out of this depot on some kind of a joint agreement. They'd get their paperwork in Missoula, but then they'd come out here and get the bills of lading and the final stuff on that. Slide, please. The bills. <coughs> Well, this is Big Blackfoot Milling Company, which is what A.B. Hammond built out there beginning in 1886. And along about 1902, he sold it to Amalgamated Copper. And Amalgamated Copper, as we all know, became ACM, Anaconda Copper Company. Uh, this is a picture here of the Big Black Milling Company. It's a postcard and it's lettered that, so it has to probably be before. Uh, eh, it's hard to tell with postcards. But the thing I notice about it is all the housing that's in what later became mill site there that I had never seen before. What a lot of people don't know, it had a twin. It had a twin at St. Regis. Big Blackfoot Milling also had a mill on that oxbow of river just to the north and east of St. Regis. Uh, not where the current mill was, but farther out. The Milwaukee reached it on a five-span bridge across the river. It was very important for them to get to it. Pretty much the same as what they do here in Bonner, reaching across the river to get into the Bonner Mill. And this mill lasts until about 1914, <coughs> and then is shut down and everything's consolidated uh, here at the Bonner uh, operation. Okay, so. And of course, the other mill that was here was Western Lumber Company. And Western Lumber <coughs> Company was originally, originally at Lothrop. Uh, Lothrop is across the river from Alberton. Uh, if you talk to the Alberton folks, they'll tell you that a lot of the buildings in downtown Alberton were slid across from Lothrop on the river ice in the wintertime when the Milwaukee came through and Lothrop was abandoned. And the mill complex was moved here, right where the truck stop is now on that part of the river. In fact, River City Grill is the paymaster's office for that and later became paymaster's office for all the employees out here Jan's dad told about when he was a young man working there, that's where he got his paycheck, was out of that building, and that safe still says Western Lumber Company on it. Uh, ACM buys this in 1909, and they use it for a number of years, <coughs> but it's just gradually folded into the, the Bonner operation, and it's pretty much gone by World War II. We saw some evidence still in that 37 aerial photo. Slide, please, Jan. We haven't talked about the Great Northern. That's the other one here, and I don't much because it didn't ever come here, and I try to focus on our area. But it was the second of the three transcontinentals, which really isn't true. None of them are transcontinentals because they only come from Chicago to the West Coast. Even to this day, there is no single line except Amtrak that goes from coast to coast. It all divides somewhere in the Midwest. Slide, please, Jan. But I get back to my ethnicity theme. This is one of my favorite photographs to talk to people about who we are. Because this is 1891. This is somewhere in Montana, somewhere on what's now the Blackfoot Indian Reservation. And this, I have to assume, is a construction crew who's been brought together for a photo. And I don't know how well you can see it on the television screen, but this is the most interesting photo to look at those faces and see who these people are. Because as when I said at the beginning of this program, we are them, we are them. You will see Native Americans, you will see Orientals, you will see all kinds of swarthy Italian types, you will see uh, 
every nationality in the world there. You see women, you see children. They had their families along, and they came out here and worked for about $2 a day and had to buy all their goodies from the company store to subsist. But somewhere along the line, they made it, and they are us. Slide, please, Jan. Let's look a little bit at the Milwaukee. Sorry, Mil, I put this off to the end. <laughs> uh, Milwaukee is built from the east-west. It wasn't built from both ends, but they kind of did it in segments, and they would build ahead. So go to the next slide, Jan. This is a, a celebratory picture taken on Pipestone Pass as the Milwaukee reaches Butte in 1908. Again, an uh, interesting ethnic study. You'll see a lot of Eastern Europeans in these photos, a lot of Italians, a lot of Montenegrins, a lot of Greeks uh, were coming to the country uh, by 1908, 1909, and the Milwaukee was using them to build their railroad. There are some excellent works done on building the big tunnel out here at Taft, which is now part of the trail system, the bicycle trail system out there, and the, how Taft in 1906 had more people living in it than Missoula. It was in Missoula County, but it was bigger than Missoula. It had no policemen assigned to it, so life was a little unusual out there. Lots of bodies showed up when the snow went off in the spring. But it was primarily staffed by Italians, Austrians, and Montenegrins. All that Adriatic country were coming this way because of things that were going on in those countries in the day. And they didn't get along with each other. And so ultimately, the Milwaukee put all of the Montenegrins on the, east, on the west side and the Italians on the east side just to keep them from knifing each other uh, for, because of their traditional family and cultural feuds, which is something we don't always think about when we think about the immigration. They bring all that baggage with them. And some of that stuff lingers on. Slide, please. This is uh, getting ready for the last, official last spike on the Milwaukee's Transcontinental, which happened out near Phosphate, uh, about a mile and a half from where the NPs did theirs. You have to kind of wonder about that. And this is kind of bogus because uh, this is staged. <clears throat> Go to another slide, Jan. Here's, uh, here's the Koreans working out there. You notice who's doing the work and who's watching in the derby hats. <clears throat> slide. This is uh, Milwaukee building crews coming into Missoula. Uh, this picture is taken right about where the university uh, maintenance away plant is there, just by Washington Grizzly Stadium. That rock face, if you walk down that hiking trail, looks pretty much like this today. And this is March. This is three months before that picture out there at, at Phosphate happens. And the headlines here is, completion of the Milwaukee Road, at least as far as Missoula. I think what happened is that when the big flood hit and everything moved over to the NP, the Milwaukee was bypassing their line up the river. It was awaiting repair. They were over on the, on the NP. There's several places if you go out and walk in that valley where you can see there's cut acrosses where they were cutting back and forth uh, between the two railroads. And I think that happens when they're on their own rails getting that far, as opposed to having some of it on the NP. The railroad um, all was opened in 1909, just in time for the big blow up out there and the forest fires and all their wooden trestles burned down and a lot of it had to be built again. So in 1908, they lost this part to the flood. <laughs> and in 1910, they lost the western part to the fire. The initial years of the Milwaukee were a struggle, <clears throat> and that's a whole nother story. Slide, please, Jan. All of the railroads marketed the land. Now, the NP had the land grants to market, but they were very good about selling it at a discount to the other railroad companies to market it as well. And there were other, they weren't land grants, but the others had land companies that bought government land sometimes for as little as 50 cents an acre, and in turn uh, marketed that to people who were coming out here homesteading. Uh, this is a brochure dated 1909, and you can see the land that they're advertising for sale here in the Missoula and Bitterroot Valleys uh, at that point in time. 
Jan's family came to Montana in 1912. Uh, they took up some great northern sail land, seven miles to the Canadian border, at a little place called uh, Gold, well, Lilac. It had a lot of names. <clears throat> About 22 miles north of Rudyard. And I want to hear that conversation. We have pictures of the family house in Iowa where they came from, which is this cute little white clapboard house with a white picket fence and mature trees. And he brings her and two children out here on the train in 1912 and puts her on a buggy. And they got to go 22 miles out across the desert to within seven miles of the Canadian border. And he hands her down from the buggy and he says, dear, I see our future here. <laughs> And I want to hear what she said to him. <laughs> the first two years, things were so thin that he went back to Iowa because he was a barber by trade. And he barbered all winter, leaving the wife and kids in the homestead. You couldn't leave the homestead or you'd give it up. In a 12-foot square soddy out there in the middle of the prairie by themselves. And it's not real nice in that part of the world in February up there. So uh, the remarkable thing is they made it. That, fa that farm is still in the family. We're not close enough to share in the profits of it, but it's still in the family and was one of the success stories of the homesteading era. So slide please, Jan. We have this nice depot here in Missoula that now is owned by the Boone and Crockett Company who have extensively renovated and nicely so and have further plans, I was told this spring when I was doing this sort of thing to the Leadership Missoula class, that they have plans now to redo the tile roof on the, on the roof, original bar tiles, because the, according to the plans, and I have all the plans for this, 56 different elevations, this is Spanish mission architectural style. Hmm. There were six of these in Montana all different shapes. All of them have a tower except for two. Bozeman didn't have a tower and Miles City didn't have a tower. Um, uh, Missoula, Butte, and Great Falls all had towers. Uh, Great Falls got the big depot because of the plans for the Missoula Eastern, the second main line, as well as Lewistown. I've always thought that tower was out of proportion. It's too tall, and it served absolutely no function. Uh, there was, at one time, a neon sign up there that said the Milwaukee Road. Uh, there was never a clock, it never had bells, it never did anything except stand up there. And I always wondered, what's that all about? And then I had an old timer tell me one time, it was up there because before they built the Wilma building, you could see it from the NP Depot. <laughs> And let everybody in town know there's competition here. We're down here in the hole, but we'll be happy to serve you also. And whether that story is true or not, I have no idea. Slide, please, Jan. And again, the ethnic groups that came to work on the railroad here are Koreans. A lot of Koreans worked on the Milwaukee Road just because of the world situation at the time. A lot of Japanese also worked in this part of the world. We don't think about Asian immigrants so much. But they were here. Um, one of the things we kind of skipped by here was a story done by a fellow who found out, he was a Japanese man, who found out that he had a relative buried in the Missoula Cemetery. And he came here and he did some research and come to find out there's a whole bunch of Japanese graves in Thompson Falls because what they did is they gathered them all up where they were buried along the right of way as they were working and buried them in a, in a single graveyard in Thompson Falls, and there's a marker up there to mark it that. The only trouble I have with that story, I've read a very similar story about the NP receiving complaints from passengers traveling in their first class coaches about the bodies strewn along the right of way as they came along the western part of Montana. Uh, apparently it was the practice at the time when a laborer died, not just Chinese, but when a laborer died, They'd cut a couple of slabs of wood, bundle them together between the slabs of wood, and bury them in the right-of-way fill. And apparently after 20 years or so, they were eroding out, and people were complaining about seeing all the bones. Chinese, 
Japanese. Kim was the newspaper good about differentiating between Oriental folks? Probably not. So I don't know. I'm a little suspicious about that one. Okay, we have covered some ethnicity. You are them. We are them. Uh, this goes on. I think of emigration after my research <clears throat> an awful lot like ocean waves coming ashore. As they come ashore and wash back, another one builds and comes ashore and washes back. And we've been doing that now since 1630, I know of, since my family came here. I worked as the farmer's market master for 18 years uh, after it was first formed in downtown Missoula in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, in about uh, 77, we received uh, all the Mongs here who were being evacuated out of Laos after the Vietnam War ended and were being resettled here in Montana. And this was a Stone Age culture. These were people who were primarily farmers, uh, pretty agrarian, and this was very strange to them. Most of them didn't speak the language. In fact, I didn't ever run across one who did. But the Refugee Assistance Service felt that farmer's market was something they could do. They could raise vegetables in their garden plots and they could come down there and they could sell product and, you know, get acclimatized into the culture. <coughs> and as the market master, guess who got to deal with them? And they were very friendly folks. They were good natured people. A lot of them had severe war injuries. Um, very few of them spoke English. And the hardest thing I had to do was explain to them, no, you can't put your produce on the bricks. You gotta have a table according to health department regulations. And they couldn't figure out, even through translations, why you gotta put your stuff up on a table. How is that different than putting it on the bricks? They'd always sold it on the bricks. As time went by, few of the adults spoke English, but I learned that you could talk to the kids. The kids were going to school, the kids were learning English, and you know, by 1980, um, a lot of them were pretty fluent in English. So you go to the kid and say, would you explain to your dad, you know, that he has to do this, and they would. Uh, they're still out there, folks. They're still part of our culture and our society. They're still at farmer's market, but you look at them today, yes, they look oriental, but they're us. They speak like us, they dress like us, they act like us, they are us, and that's immigration and how it works. Demographers will tell you, first generation struggles because of language difficulties. They work very hard to make their children Americans, so those kids grow up without any sense of the native culture. Parents didn't tell them, didn't want them to know, you're an American. The third generation comes along and they are Americans, but now they're curious about where they came from. Why is my last name Vang? Why do I look different than everybody else? And they struggle to, to recapture some of that heritage. And that's where the genealogy comes in. So it's a process. Some of this probably sounds familiar with some things going on in the world right now. Uh, and I'm not political, so I'm not want to get into that. But uh, this is what I know about ethnicity and the coming of the railroads to Bonner, Montana. And thank you very much. You. How close are we to pasties? Anna? Oh, hang, hang on, hang on. Because I can field some questions if you want. Yeah, that's what you're you want to be the question guy? Let, let us pass you the microphone to ask any questions or comments. Yes, if it's on. See if it's on. Can you hear me? I can. I was going to ask about the Illinois Central Railroad, since you know a lot about that. My great. Well, I don't know there. a lot about the Illinois Central Railroad, I th other than I think the fix was in with the land grants. Mm -hmm. They were a short railroad that went along the Mississippi River, was in a transcontinental, didn't get a step closer to the west. Uh, but did receive the land grants. Uh, it must have been good, uh, whatever Lincoln was. Uh, I, I can't talk about the Illinois Centralists. I'm a very regional historian. Okay. And where were your family from in Iowa? <laughs> good question. Uh, Jan was from Winterset, and uh, mine weren't in Iowa, they were in Indiana. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and they left to, to come over the Oregon Trail in 1853, sixth month journey. In another 30 years, you could make that same journey in about four days on the train. <laughs> uh, there was some serious articles written by scientists in the 70s and 80s about is the human body able to withstand speeds of 45 miles an hour? <laughs> Are we meant to travel that fast? Because throughout human history, forever, no man had ever traveled faster than a horse could run unless he fell off a cliff and he didn't live, tell about it. So uh, I can't answer your question about the Illinois Central, I'm sorry. The reason sorry. I was wondering is my uh, great-grandfather worked on the Illinois Central, and he was out of Cherokee, Iowa, mm -hmm. and he worked in the roundhouse. And I have a picture from 1904 when my grandmother was born, Fine. which I was real proud to have that. And I saw a lot of my aunts and uncles and relatives. Five of um, my grandmother's cousins were all engineers for the Illinois Central Railroad. That's why I was asking. Uh, Milt, you can help me with this one. <laughs> I would imagine the Illinois Central has a historical association that uh, deals with it. Sure. I believe they do. Yeah. You can easily do a search on the internet, look for Illinois Central Historical Society, and it'll get, get some hit. And at least it'll give you other places to look uh, to find out information about what your relatives were doing. Sorry, I can't help. Here's one back there. You showed a photo of a crew. I, is this on? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And uh, it had a lot of ethnicity in it, and you mentioned a lot of different people. Were there many black people working on the railroads then? I don't see many black faces mm -hmm. in photographs. I'm sure there were some. Uh, whether they avoided the photographs or they were shunted aside, uh, black history in this country takes a different avenue than most immigration. Uh, for a lot of different reasons. Um, I, when I went to high school in Billings in the 60s, we had one black student there, and he was kind of a school pet. He was a good athlete, good looking guy, very friendly. I knew nothing about black culture or, or those folks until I got in the US Army. And I walked into my first platoon assignment at Fort Lewis, Washington, and it was 80% black, and I thought, oh my god, what has happened to me? because it was my problem, I knew that. And I thought everybody was doing things with their mothers, because that's all I heard. <laughs> oh, that's your imagination. <clears throat> um, we just don't see many black faces. There were some, there were some here uh, that came up during the Civil War as uh, refugees, escaped slaves, whatever. Uh, there are families of them in Montana that I'm aware of. Uh, I don't see a lot of associations on the railroads. There's a lot of associations. On the Milwaukee, the uh, passenger car services were primarily... Oh, well, that's a whole different story, but those aren't Montanans. Those passenger cars were crewed out of Chicago and Seattle. <laughs> you did. Pullman Porters was almost an exclusively black occupation, especially as you get into the 30s. Another one, your, your picture's gone now, but you had four gentlemen. Hold on just, just a second. We, we need to get you on the mic to get the recorded. So, sorry. The voice isn't that good. You, you had that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd mentioned Koreans, and I don't have any record myself of Koreans ever working for the Milwaukee. These were Japanese. Uh, one of them, is his last name is Sataki. Yeah, which became uh, I know I knew Mr. Sataki. I think he's passed away now. Well, th th that was the first. This is the first generation Satakis. Okay. This is 1908. Yeah. Uh, Shiro Sataki. I have information telling you that there were lots of Koreans working on the Milwaukee. I I do not know of any. I will uh, share that with you if we can communicate. No, I'd, I'd be glad glad yeah, to yeah. try try and do it because I, I I did a historical research of, of non-Americans mm. who built out west for the Milwaukee and. Uh, they were almost entirely uh, Japanese. And this Japanese crew, it's interesting, uh, they're all dressed up. Yes. This when is I was a, reading a book, that's a very posed picture. Oh, yeah. They were proud of this picture. Yes. But during the last spike ceremony, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, the uh, uh, general superintendent wanted Japanese workers to be placing the last spike. 
they didn't have any. These guys were up on the Butte Hill. So they drove them, they brought them down for the last spike ceremony, told them to wear clean overalls, mm. and they took out a, a rail that had already been laid and then put it back in for the last spike photos. It was just an interesting. I have a Milwaukee rule book that's mm -hmm. written in, in Korean. Seriously, I'd love to see it. Uh, if I can find it. What's your name, sir? Uh, Michael Saul. Well, Michael, you and I have run around each other for years. I think it's the first time you've ever actually talked. Well, no, actually, uh, you, were, you were at a, a, a tr um, sales thing, and we talked a little bit. Did we? But you were sitting yeah. down, and I was standing up. Okay. Michael Saul is a very renowned Milwaukee Road historian. He's written a number of things. Uh, I would never go against his expertise, but I have a rule book written in Korean. I, I'd, love to see, I'd love to see that. It's the first I've heard of it. I think Bill, the other Bill is next. The other Bill, uh oh. Yeah. At, at what point did the railroad take possessions, or actual ownership of the alternate section? I'm not aware that they ever did. Uh, they may have done some purchase agreements for adjacent lands when they had a project of some kind, uh, but uh, there was some consolidation work done uh, over time where they put things together and land was freed up for other uses because a, a single section isn't really good for much in this day and age of farming. Uh, but I'm not aware of a specific program well, uh, didn't to make that come together. Didn't they actually took ownership of the alternate sections, did they not? Uh, not that I'm aware of. They were just the ones they were given. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. But not the other ones. Yes, the alternate ones that they acquired. Did they? Was that when the railroad was completed? Cut, actually, wrapped, it happened and frozen? in 1877. Uh, the railroad was begun in 1870, went bankrupt in 1873 with the ends at Bismarck and at Wallula, Washington. And then it was moribund for uh, about six years uh, while they sorted out the finances and it was taken over by a different group of officers and come together again. Uh, but those lands were granted on the survey uh, that was done, you know, Isaac Stevens did the early ones, but the, the uh, Miller, uh, what's the guy, the surveyor that was out here? No, well, Mullen was part of his crew. Anyway, that, so those surveys were done in the 70s and approved by Congress, and the land was deeded uh, to the NP. One, there was some awkwardness about that, because the NP's f first <coughs> survey went down the Deer Lodge Valley and over Deer Lodge Pass and down the Jefferson, because it's the lowest pass, easiest construction. The UP got there first. The UP didn't get the land grants. The NP had land grants where they couldn't use them so much. So there's some awkward places in that. When the NP wanted to shorten up the line by building over Stampede Pass in 1886, um, they petitioned to get more land grants to offset the cost of that. And by that time, the bloom was off the lily and Congress denied that and threatened to take the existing ones away that they'd been granted. So land grants, you could write books on land grants and probably not capture all of it. It wasn't very popular in Montana at all because it took uh, 14 million acres out of production for Montana citizens and there was a lot of pushback about that. The Northern Pacific land grants were difficult because there was no surveys out there. That's right. They hadn't surveyed them. The only way the Northern Pacific could get get their land grants was to do the surveys. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. And so every year they would survey sections here and there to get possession, to get the title to them. But by the 1930s, Congress finally said, you're, not, you're still not done getting your land grants. We're taking the rest away. And they lost 24 million acres of land grants. Technically, they just didn't get around. They didn't prove them. The process was called right. proving. Right. Concerning land grants and alternative land grants, you stated that the alternative land grants did not get the mineral rights. Right. What about the regular land grants? None of the land grants came with mineral rights. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
They were specifically excluded. Thank you. My great grandparents in the very early 1900s came into some property uh, what, what, the Rattlesnake, which is now Apple Grove. When they developed it, they called it Rose Acres. Um, and, um, with, and I know that the deed from way back when mentions railroad. Would that have been the NP? Probably a land grant section. Uh, the first house we bought was in Boulder, Montana, 30 miles from Helena. And in those days, they were still giving you abstract for deeds. And the first entry was NPRR that far from the main line. So it would not surprise me that you had a little piece of land in the rattlesnake. And there were water rights somehow, which I can't explain, yeah, didn't, didn't absorb. Yeah, different kind of thing, yeah. Over here, if we have the microphone. This is not a question, but something to add to your reference about the Koreans and the Japanese, mostly the Japanese. My background goes into Three Forks. And before I was born, my mother in the 30s and her parents and family, there were three for sure, maybe four families of Japanese in Three Forks. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. The Itos, yeah. Uh, the uh, Kogas. Uh, the Oys, and so on. Anyway, they were good friends of my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And they, the parents of the Itos were working on the Milwaukee Road down uh, Jefferson Canyon toward Butte. And they came to my grandmother and said, would you take care of our children while we're working for the railroad? Because if there's any sabotage oh, and yeah. we get blamed, we don't want it to fall on our children. So they came to live with my yeah. grandparents' family. The most famous of that is Yokoshi Ito, who was the doctor in Livingston that everybody knew about, and the member of the 442nd Battalion that was shot up so badly at Anzio Beach. But anyway, that's just a tidbit of information. Appreciate that. And just a little side note. In fact, I took the picture out of the program of a group of five American doughboys in World War I standing on Merritt and Trestle looking very bored because there was enough German settlement in the Missoula Bitterroot Valleys that the government was worried about sabotage. And they stationed troops on what they called, uh, well, important facilities like Merritt Trestle out here at Deep Creek and, and several other places. And uh, that had to be just a horribly boresome duty, I would think, sitting out there in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Uh, and in World War II, you see some of that, not as much with, with Japanese, where Japanese were in great numbers. Because we all know about Japanese and what happened to them in the concentration camps. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to comment uh, on something, on a current event here at, in Missoula. My daughter, Mary, is the first woman yard master here in Missoula. Well, and there. just a little uh, anecdotal story. I, when I visited Mary, when she had a, her little girl, Molly, um, I went visited her in her hospital room. And I couldn't get in the door because all the Missoula engineers who weren't on the trains uh, were in her room. So she's very proud of that. So. Very good. Yes, thank you. Yes. You had a hand, right? Oops, okay. And there's one back there, Kim. I don't know whether I can do this or not. Uh, my voice is very bad. But my grandparents, of course, I might you. My mom was a single mother, and, and you were a freak that you didn't have a dad in grade school. But where this is going was that, that my entire family was tied to the NP Railroad. My grandfather worked in the roundhouse as a boiler maker, and my grandmother's young brother, he came over from Norway, and he 
they always talked about him as a candy dancer. And so it kind of blew me away that, that possibly to what you're saying he wasn't. Uh, the, what wasn't? I didn't understand. That, that would there have been Norwegians? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes. Are there so, Norwegians in this room? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and he was a candy dancer. My Irish wife had a great comeuppance when she went to genealogy. Her dad was convinced he was Irish. His mother had been adopted by a family, and she always told him he was Irish. The two boys here in Bonner grew up Irish. His brother was a big red-headed man. He looked Irish. <laughs> And Bob celebrated uh, St. Patty's Day, and then we did the DNA stuff. <laughs> and I'm sure glad he was dead because <laughs> I don't think he could have handled the fact that there is no or very little Irish in that family. His, his mother appeared to be very Norwegian. <laughs> and so there's a lot of Norwegian, but no Irish, unfortunately. Well, and, and Thank you, though. all the immigrants that do come, yes. or that did come, they were very proud of being American. They were. Because, as I say, I lived with mom's mom and dad, my grandma and grandpa, and I would ask them, Grandma, I want to learn Norwegian. You don't need to know right. Norwegian. See, you there, are there's, an American. There's the story right there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And go to Grandpa. Yep. Yeah. What did they say in sweet Grandpa? <laughs> now the two of them would get into a fight. Yes. Like any married couple, and and he might have come from a war a little too late, and the words would fly. Norwegian and sweet, and each one could pick up just enough to know what the other one was Well, they knew say. all the bad words, don't you know? Yeah. <laughs> yes. We've got lots of time for more, but do we have a pasty update in the back? About 20 minutes to four or so, then we we'll need to uh, open up some room to get some more tables set up. Uh, so we got more time for questions. I was going to ask Bill if you would maybe have some information on the Black Foot Railroad. <clears throat> um, there's lots of information on the Blackfoot Railroad, but that's a whole other program. <laughs> maybe two. Well, I've got a little bit. Uh, yeah, uh, I did. You're right. I did stick a couple of slides on the end here. Uh, you all know the movie Timberjack, right? 1955, Sterling Hayden, horribly corny. I just watched it again last night on a CD. And once you hear that music, you can't get it out of your head. <laughs> hurry back, hurry back. But it is terrific scenes of up the river during the logging railroad days. They had the Willamette running for that, for the filming of the crew. And it was quite an event here in Bonner. And uh, I was fortunate enough to acquire a collection of photographs of not only the publicity stills from Timberjack, but also an old fellow by the name of Miller, who was out there shooting veterans at these things, and his pictures. And I've shared that with the Bonner group. But <clears throat> 1955, I would have been nine years old. I wasn't here. I was in. Helen at the time. But I got to figure these kids are about that same age. They look pretty nice. Obviously, they've come out to the filming of Timberjack, and they're watching it. And you can see by the looks on their face how, what a wonderful time they're having. <laughs> the teachers no doubt told them to be quiet, stand there, you know, don't bother the filmmakers, etc. And I have to believe, looking around this audience, that some of you are there. <laughs> Anybody want to acknowledge the fact? You no doubt remember this. Our, our resident hooligan was there. Your He's not here today. Not here? This was in September of 1954. Was when 54? Uh, there's also a picture of what looked like middle schoolers and high schoolers. You don't want to see the high school one. <laughs> 
<laughs> and a lot of interesting pictures as well. Let's back up a slide or two, Jan. Uh, the old Willamette uh, that actually was delivered to Western Lumber Company in 1923 uh, ran out in the nine mile, ran up at Plains, I hear. Uh, not sure how much it actually ran in the Blackfoot, but when the companies were consolidated, it ended up here. And there's a picture of it that you just flashed by of sitting very derelict in the back of the log yard here in Bonner. But when the movie company was trying to find an engine, they came on this one and they restored it to operating condition. And that's the engine that you see in Timberjack running up and down the line. Uh, it's kind of deceptive because sometimes it's numbered number 17 and then the next frame is number seven. <laughs> And in real life, it was number seven because it was the seventh Willamette built uh, in that configuration. Uh, it had the big stack on it as a spark arrester for operating in the woods, even though it was oil fired. I had always heard that when they rehabbed it for the movie, they just went in and they put galvanized fittings in and things, and then they pushed it back into the log yard without capping the stack or anything, and it was all rust inside. And, and horrible. That's the stories I'd heard. But this is in the process of being restored. It's out at Fort Missoula. There's a gentleman who's a retired general manager from uh, the Sierra Railroad in California who's kind of undertaking the restoration of it. He's actually operated the steam engines on air, and he tells me that the boiler uh, holds air pressure when you do that, and he has great hopes of, of maybe seeing it run. I'm not sure it's ever going to be under fire because they stripped all the asbestos off of it when they moved it out to Fort Missoula. That would all have to be redone, but it still lives, and you can go see it out at uh, Fort Missoula at the logging display out there if you choose to do so. Uh, <coughs> the, very briefly, since we have 20 minutes, the Big Blackfoot Railroad was chartered in 1908. <coughs> the Milwaukee bought the rights to it. I don't think Big Blackfoot ever ran on this part of it. Uh, they ran up at Potomac, but not here. Uh, the Milwaukee had great plans of the second line to Great Falls. And Michael, maybe you're better off talking about this than me, but it kind of sputtered along. But the grade was done clear to Browns Lake, which is over there by Ovando. And you can still see that grade, particularly with uh, Google Earth uh, now. And they had plans of going over uh, could not pass where Lewis and Clark went and on out across to Great Falls, tying in with their uh, Judith Basin lines and then east uh, eventually. But the 1922 bankruptcy put an end to that. They also surveyed up to Fernie, uh, B.C. for coal. And, you, and there's some of us who have survey maps that were rescued out of the Flathead County Courthouse, uh, the, the original linens of that projected line that would go up the Sealy Swan and up into Canada through the North Fork uh, to the coal mines. That also was never constructed. The <coughs> uh, ACM, uh, when they were still doing logging trains, sort of absconded with some of the right-of-ways that were built as part of the Missoula and Eastern, especially when they moved over on the east side of, of Greeno Hill. And there was always a cozy relationship because now we're getting deep into it, Michael. There is this interesting financial connection between the Milwaukee Road, ACM Copper, Montana Power, and Standard Oil. And uh, when the Milwaukee came through, ACM converted almost entirely to using Milwaukee Road as freight out of Butte and Anaconda, and also out of the mill here and out of St. Regis, um, and that changed over the years, but when built, there was that interesting financial connection between the various firms and some cooperative agreements. Michael, you speak to that. You know more about that sure. than I do. Uh, they'd originally, the Milwaukee had originally bought the big Blackfoot uh, uh, railroad, uh, and part of it was to reach the, um, and you can still see the right of way if you're going up 200 as you cross the Blackfoot River. It, it's up in the hills. It doesn't go all, all along the valley floor all the way past Potomac and up to the old camp. And the old camp is still there at the other end of the Blackfoot Valley. It's kind of deteriorated, but 
That was the Anaconda Company camp. But uh, the Milwaukee then, before you get to the bridge that crosses the Blackfoot River, shifted to follow the river and then up to Clearwater Junction. Back up, Jan. Back up. And at Clearwater Junction, then the back. idea was. Yep, back there. Ah. You, continue, you, uh, you would continue north from Clearwater Junction uh, up the north fork of the, Black, of the uh, Flathead River into Canada because the Milwaukee Road had gotten some huge coal leases, metallurgical quality coal, it was very high quality, to feed the Anaconda Company in Great Falls and Butte. So bring the, all that uh, coal back down. The line they surveyed over the uh, Continental Divide was a 1% grade. It was the easiest crossing of the Continental Divide of any Western Railroad. And they had the survey. And then uh, up the river, and I've got, I've got the survey maps of, of the line still. But uh, and then all the way up to Great Falls with the idea, as you said, of, well, we're going to continue. We're going to make a passenger route through Montana. That's why there's that big, huge depot in Great Falls. With an even taller tower than Missoula. It's the biggest Ten pass feet taller than the GN Tower down the street. Oh, geez. <laughs> no, it was, the, it was the biggest passenger Size depot. Size does they, matter. They, they built in, in Montana, and in the 1927 bankruptcy, John D. Ryan, who was the director in Montana Power Company and everything else, uh, he was questioned, you know, the railroad went broke. How come they built this great big depot in Great Falls, Montana? He was Irish. His answer was, Senator, the people of Great Falls surely deser deserved a fine railway depot. <laughs> For those of us who've grown up in this state and go back into the post-war years, the 50s and 60s, I won't take you any farther than that. If somebody said to you, we can't do that because the company doesn't like it, who's the company? Anaconda Company. Anaconda Company ruled Montana, not overtly, but covertly. They were into politics, they were into economics, they controlled the Lee Enterprise newspapers. Uh, the only one that was not controlled by ACM was the Great Falls Tribune. And, and that was just a political reality when I was a young guy growing up in Helena uh, of who the company was. And the company was bigger than that. It was ACM. It was uh, Montana Power, because of the John D. Ryan connection. It was the Milwaukee Road, and it was a lot of logging operations down the Bitterroot and out on the West End, out here around Heron, that provided uh, huge employments for uh, labor here in Montana. And it was just one of those things. Uh, with the closing of the smelters and the mines and the tapering off in Butte, that's kind of gone away. But you kind of got to understand that reality of Montana's politics and uh, belief system if you've grown up here. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Question from across the room. Um, What's a Gandhi dancer? <laughs> a Gandhi dancer is a guy who drives the spikes, works on the railroad. When uh, I was in college uh, and employment was hard to find in the summertime, you could always go to work for the Northern Pacific as a Gandhi dancer out working on the track crew, but everybody knew it was a killer. You know, it was hard work driving spikes, carrying heavy uh, ties and rails and things. And uh, I never did it, <laughs> fortunately, but a lot did. It's a, uh, I don't work, comes from originally. Milt, where does Gandhi Dancer come from? Where does that name come from? <laughs> Excuse me. Michael, where's Gandhi Dancer come from? Well, now you see, you said you knew everything. <laughs> the pry bars? The pry bars. I'm wondering if it has to do with moving rail into position, and it took a number of workers with pry bars working in a rhythm, and that's part of the reason the singing is associated with it. There was that There is some interesting movie and, footage from the 20s and yes, 30s of those crews working I think that's the dancing. Together. It could be yeah. that's where that comes from. You're probably right. Yeah. That's why I've been married to her for 54 years. I, I have a question. I've 
I understood that different nationalities did different work on the railroads. Mm. Um, is that not? I think that's an oversimplification. I think labor was labor, and I think they ended up paying the foreign gangs less than they did uh, for American labor, uh, but at the most it was $2 a day back in the late 19th century. And there's an interesting story in your newspaper uh, in 1890, uh, four brothers from Missoula heard about the great northern hiring labor up to build the High Line over Marias Pass. So off they went, uh, and they signed up, and they had the heck work out of them. And they finally decided they weren't making any money because by the time they paid the company store what they owed them, uh, they were in the hole. And then they decided to come home again. They got caught in a big, huge blizzard, and one of them died. And it was just this huge disaster of going up and working on the railroad. But uh, I, I don't think there was a distinction in jobs. There were teamsters and there were graders and there were other people, but that's not common <coughs> labor. Those are s skilled positions. One thing I think you could say is that the uh, construction of the railroads was done by contractors. Mm -hmm. And therefore, most of the people working like, like building the uh, St. Paul Pass Tunnel uh, building track were, were actually employed by like Winston Brothers mm -hmm. contractors, so they were not really railroad employees. Yeah, they were paid by the contractor and hired by the contractors and fired by the contractors. Yes, you're absolutely right. Well, and, I, and I was going to mention too, there was some distinction. Uh, you had the slide up there of the uh, four Japanese gentlemen. Oops. Up on the uh, uh, up on the Butte Hill, and were brought down for the last spike ceremony just just because they were the only Japanese they could find. But uh, later on, up into modern times, the Milwaukee Road Steel Gang, which was the the gang that was responsible for laying new track and new steel, uh, was the Koga Gang, and that was all Japanese. And the reason given to me for that was. They liked the same foods. They were easier to keep together on the trains. Both of those gangs came over as cohesive units. They were under contract, and quite often the contract holder was ethnically what the gang was, and they'd put those gangs together overseas, bring them over here. They did a specific task for a specific time. At the end of the contract, they went home again. Quite often the gang was paid, not individually, but the gang leader was paid. And he was, it was up to him to uh, disperse the money correctly. And uh, the suspicion, I think, always was that maybe some of that didn't make it. Uh, so it, you're, you're absolutely right, Milt. It was, those are contract operations. And we, I think one uh, good example of uh, somebody that was probably employed by contractors originally was the uh, Hiro Sataki, and but managed to after the construction get a job with the railroad, and then ended up uh, living his life here in Montana. Had many, I think he had ten children, and uh, many of them got jobs with the Milwaukee Road. Maybe. And uh, yeah. the Thanks, one of the uh, uh, Jim Sataki just passed away here a couple of years ago. Uh, he was the youngest of the children and, and uh, lived in Three Forks and was in uh, train service between uh, Three Forks and Harleton. I, I did a short survey and I found about 27 uh, Japanese had gone to work for the Milwaukee uh, during and after construction and most of them stayed, or their descendants, uh, stayed working here in Montana and northern Idaho. Um, uh, it, it became an inherited position, basically. Um, I, I, I'm not an ethnologist, so I don't claim to be an expert on this, but my sense is that the anti-Asian feeling in Montana wasn't as great as other places. That, that's, that's very true. During World War II, uh, the government was uh, expressing concerns about the Jap Japanese workers for the Milwaukee. And the Milwaukee refused to do what uh, Franklin Roosevelt wanted to do, which was, you know, send them to camps. 
And so uh, Milwaukee protected their employees during the war from retribution, I guess. So a clarification on our pasty sales. Uh -oh. They're five bucks for a pasty, seven bucks if you want a dinner, which includes coleslaw and gravy. You can take, take them out or eat them here. We are going to rearrange the room so we can spread out the tables. And unless, and first of all, we need to thank Bill and Jan for a great program. Thank you.